Today I'm speaking with Pat Ryan, the CEO of UCOR, and we're getting some very interesting information about U UCOR's progress towards becoming the West's first heavy wear earth dedicated processing plant or building such a plant. Uh, Pat, can, can you take us through uh, where you are today in processing heavy wear earths? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jack. Um, the um, the Kingston demonstration plant, the King's, Kingston demonstration facility, uh, or CDF as we call it, where we're running our rapid SX technology, we're developing flow sheets, and the flow sheets are then to be plugged into Louisiana, where the larger strategic metals complex number one will be built. And and you when you develop a flow sheet, as you know, you've got to you've got to take everything from start right through to finish. So you're going from the the leaching at the front end your uh, serum depletion, your atrium removal, the actual rapid SX technology that allows you to separate very efficiently uh, the heavy rare earth into a chloride. And then the system that takes that chloride and uh, distills, neutralizes, and turns it into an oxide. So you've got to get oxalic acid and turn it into a, a, a final oxide product. So all of that being balanced all the way through from start to finish is what we've been doing in Kingston and running many, many hours in order to achieve that. Um, we've run several different feedstocks through the facility now. Uh, we've run monazite, uh, bastazite. We're currently running an ionic clay for the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense has a heavy rare earth processing uh, program where they've said, let's take your technology and let's actually go ahead and develop the um, heavy rare earth metrics to be able to commercialize and move further. So the team's been very much dialed into, let's take our technology, let's develop the complete flow sheets uh, to be able to get to the uh, commercialization side. So sort of a copy and paste. And packaged in all of that, as you would know, Jack, is a feasibility studies, much like in a mining operation where you have pre-feasibility, feasibility, bankable feasibility. you got to make sure your feasibility is very sound as well. And so all of the assumptions on, on uh, CapEx costs, operating procedural costs, equipment lists, um, a P and ID drawings, all of that has to come into uh, to sync to be able to develop a commercial plant at the end of the day that, that uh, del delivers product. And yeah, heavy earth is where we are. Um, and just as a marker of success with that, uh, you know, we um, with the DOD program running on, on a clay, we currently have a concentration of 98% um, dysprosium, 2% terbium, both of them heavy, of course. And we're continuing to fine tune the, uh, the chemical knife to just get that dysprosium down to a little bit further to where it's 99.8, which I think is market uh, currently in China. But uh, certainly metal makers can use a 98.2%. Uh, but that, that's proof that we've actually gone through and developed the heavy rare earth that we need to, and we've got customers lining up for, for all of it. So that's kind of a quick summary of, of what we've been up to in Kingston, Jack, as we keep our eyes on Louisiana for plant number one. Well, let me tell you what amazes me. Uh, I've always thought that you cannot take individual parts of the total rare earth permanent magnet supply chain and make money doing it. You have to be careful what you do. But you, your plan, and I assume your, your understanding of the economics is that this operation will be, will be a standalone profitable operation. You don't need a mine. You don't, you're not going to make uh, metals and magnets. You're going to, you're going to literally either coal refine material from customers or you'll buy the material on, on your own account and process it. But I don't. I don't see you as worrying about a mine, which I think is is confusing people. That's why they don't understand what you're doing. You don't need a mine. In my yeah, opinion. that's correct. Um, you know, the uh, when you look at the the nodes of the supply chain for rare earth, as you well know, Jack. You know, on the far left, you've got your your mining operation. You've got your uh, uh, beneficiation uh, leaching side of of the process, and then the mid market. Where you get the real heavy lifting done, where you develop those rare earth oxides that are then usable by the metal makers and the magnet makers or the alloy makers and the magnet makers. That middle of the market is where there is a lot of opportunity. It, it's technically very challenging, uh, yeah. but when you do a good job and figure out how to get the OPEX uh, online, get the CAPEX contained, and, and think about the business of what you're doing, you actually are able then to build a bit of a bridge and that you have a quasi sort of arrangement with your feedstock company. Uh, to ensure that your success is their success and you actually have a quasi downstream as you know the margins are very slim on the metal making side of things a little bit better when you get to alloy 
But for a metal maker to try to come up in the West and actually uh, look at making a profit, it, it, it's get, it gets very skinny. So if you can take that mid-market opportunity of separation, which is where we are, and actually have a quasi arrangement with a metal maker and an alloy maker that then feeds to a magnet maker and likewise upstream, not buying the feedstock, but creating a, a pain gain, as the Australians call it, model, uh, you, can, you can develop a very sound economic model, which the West needs. Everyone's got to be healthy. And that mid-market, because of our technology, because of the, uh, uh, the margin that's available there, uh, we're able to develop this bridge, if you will, to, uh, to help everyone become economically viable and, and do what needs to be done. But no need to purchase feedstock uh, or no need to have a mine, I should say. Uh, acquiring feedstock, yes. Quasi-joint venture, yes. And that's how it all uh, economically works out. And we've got some very, very deep economic models that show how all of that makes sense and uh, Jack, not to go too far afield, but I think there was a, an article you commented on recently where the tariffs on permanent magnets are uh, set to go to 25% EVs at 100% uh, coming into from, from China. But that permanent magnet one in particular gives you a 25%, let's not call it a, a subsidy because it's not. It's just a fair um, starting ground where you now have a 25% advantage. So if Shanghai Metal is announcing a certain price on any day of the week, you can probably add 25% to that in the Western right. world and get to a, a, a better economic footing, if you will. Let me ask you a, a question about finance. You you mentioned on a previous talk that you had uh, you had substantial net high net worth investors backing you. And what intrigues me is that you are the very first dedicated to heavyware separation plant I have ever heard of outside of China, and I'm an old man, so I haven't heard in a very long time about this. I congratulate you on that. But I know that legacy institutional investors <clears throat> would say to you right away, hey, is this the way everybody does it? And you'd say, no, it's new. And they say, well, we, we can't get involved in that. So you have you have managed to finance this against, against the stream. Am I wrong? I mean... I can't see that institutional finance is, is running to see you. And if they do now, it's a little late. You, you don't need them anymore. Yeah, we have, um, as I mentioned in, in some previous uh, discussion, Jack, we, we have a number of offtake people that are customers that are looking at our technology and our operation, realize that this is actually needed in the Western world. And, and the fact that we're on the Gulf Coast of the U.S. is a, a good place to be for plant number one. And you have the governments that are looking at us going, well, this is a really competitive uh, technology and actually a more economical technology, both from a CapEx and OpEx, ESG footprint, less power, less people time. Uh, let's invest further to make sure that technology is developed and secured in the North American, Western world and, and Europe as well. We've had a lot of interest from Australia, from Europe, and, and certainly uh, in North America, where we're building plant number one. So yeah, we're we're looking at the uh, the customers that are saying we want an offtake. We like what you're uh, producing, what you're selling, your business planning, your business model, and the government's saying we need to get behind this to make sure that this technology now remains and stays in the Western world uh, to give that competitive uh, advantage that's needed. Well, it, it's not necessarily a matter of staying here; it's a matter of being here. It's even more fundamental than that. Okay, it, it's it's like for a change. We've developed a technology that that we're going to keep to ourselves, and I congratulate you on that. Also, uh, question: What's your timeline and your target production? Uh, timeline is uh, Q4 of 2025. We're looking to begin at 2,500 tons per annum exurium exitrium, which of course creates about a 6,000 raw concentrate going through the plant from 2,500 ton heading into 26. Uh, we'll get to a 5,000 ton per annum plant. And this technology is scalable and modular, Jack, with uh, you know, off-the-shelf pumps and PLCs and, and piping and things that we put together along with our proprietary technology that allows it all to work in harmony to get the job done. And then eventually get to a 7,500 ton per annum plant in Louisiana for plant number one, which again is about 16,000 tons of raw concentrate going through the facility. So that, that's, that's our growth plan, scalable what? modular, beginning in Q4 of 25. What's the distribution of rare earths in your product? You're saying, you know, 2,500 tons, 5,000 tons, 7,500 tons of what? Uh, so heavy and light. So when you look at the uh, the 2,500 ton per annum, we'll have um, the rapid SX te technology, their uh, machines or, or production systems. So we'll have three light lines and three heavy lines. And for Louisiana, 2,500 ton, 
we're looking at uh, 1,500 tons of uh, light rare earth and 900 tons to 1,000 of heavy rare earth uh, for that first tranche of 2,500 ton per annum. Um, if you get to even that level, in my opinion, you you would be the largest heavy rare earth separation plant in the world. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure about the world, but I certainly know in the Western world there's nothing. So yeah, that that level of well, uh, if you if you produce five grams today, you'd be the leading. Yeah. Well, I'll the, so no, the the 1,500 tons or th even a, a thousand tons of heavy rare earth is extraordinary. Okay, and and I I think that there's two things happening here. My opinion. You're flying under the radar, okay, because you, you're not out there talking about this endlessly to uh, audiences that really don't understand. And you're ac you actually have gotten the job done. Now, the, the, the thing here is that you have made me understand now what the DOD is up to. I couldn't for the life of me understand why they were bothering with a magnet plant in South Carolina when there's no feedstuff. Okay. And even if we have an American light wearer of feedstock, so what? Okay. Because if you can't make the magnets you need for high temperature applications without the heavy wear earths. So I understand now that they're a lot smarter than I thought they were. And and they're back, they seem to be backing you to, to the hill. And so again, I congratulate you. And I can't imagine that anyone else is going to catch up with you in the near term, if ever. Okay, well, so. I think the uh, the under the radar is certainly true, Jack. And you know, in this industry, as, as small as it is, uh, you, you've got to be you've got to be strategic. You've got to be confidential. You've got to protect all the relationships yeah. that are evolving. And and uh, I've commented in an earlier discussion where those relationships are taking hold. And, and it, you're right; the government are looking at us, going. Okay, you've got technology here. It's got all kinds of markers of success of what the Western world should be pursuing. Let's get behind it, but let's do it in tranches. So they've they've been you know behind the scenes in tranches supporting us as we move forward in a very rig a rigid schedule to deliver. Uh, I think I mentioned previously, you know, we've got a, a ninety eight percent uh, disposium, two percent turbium mixture right now, developed on the Rapid SX technology uh, uh, column based system. And we're fine tuning that a bit further to get to a, a different kind of disposal, but our aspirations are going beyond that. But we're looking at, you know, the throughputs, uh, the flow sheets, the uh, the day to day activity that uh, has to be ESG compliant. Um, you know, delivering opex all the time, all the key metrics that go into a plant, everything that you need to be able to validate, and make sure your system is is um, again the the word feasibility. Uh, you've got to have a feasibility system that takes everything we've learned in. Kingston at the commercial demo plant, and it transfers to Louisiana very effectively. And I've had a I've had a career doing that in the automotive industry. So certainly um, uh, coaching the team of chemists, mechanical engineers, process engineers uh, to be able to get the same thing done with this uh, this technology. Uh, uh, to wind this up, Pat, I I actually am sort of speechless, which is unusual for me. And I, I think you've done an outstanding job. And I'd love to be able to compare you with someone, but I can't because there isn't anyone else. And I don't think the investing public understands one thing, that without heavy rare earths, there'll be no rare earth permanent magnet industry in the West. And so you're actually the key guy. I, I hope you have a lot of uh, key man insurance and, uh, and an armed bodyguard because you're a very important person in, in the Western world's. Uh, quest to at least make enough of these rare earth permanent magnets so that we can be secure uh, in the future. Uh, I, I hope, I don't know if you've noticed today's announcements about Chinese, uh, new Chinese laws taking effect October 1st, severely restricting trade in rare earths inside and outside of China. Uh, and all such trades will be, sub will be monitored and controlled by the central government. Uh, so uh, the good old good old days uh, are over. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Jack. Appreciate it.